evening, uh, Minister. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome along to your Scottish Parliament uh, for this evening's reception on bringing to life how yoga can support positive mental health. Uh, for those of you who, who don't uh, know who I am, I'm Angus MacDonald, MSP for Falkirk East, uh, and I'm delighted to be able to host this evening's uh, reception. It's a great pleasure to welcome you all here, and I'm pleased to see uh, a number of my colleagues from, uh, from across the chamber here tonight. Um, there are a number of other events in Parliament this evening, so uh, members of the Scottish Parliament have to spread themselves uh, quite thin this evening. Uh, however, I expect uh, MSP colleagues to be popping in and out over the course of the evening uh, to learn a bit more about this great initiative. Now, um, some of you may be looking at me and thinking he must be one of the most unlikeliest of all the MSPs to be hosting <laughs> an event on yoga, uh, not least because I'm so unfit, I'd probably get uh, stuck if I, if I tried any of it. However, I'm looking forward to having a shot at the chair yoga, which uh, uh, Lindsay Porter has promised a demonstration of later, and there's a good chance that I might just, uh, might just manage that. Um, of course, tonight is also to highlight the, the benefits that yoga can bring to mental health. Uh, and having been approached by Lindsay to host this event tonight, and hearing what a great initiative this is, uh, highlighting the connections between yoga and the benefits to mental health, uh, it was clear to me that this was an initiative uh, worth sharing widely and uh, spreading uh, the word as, as uh, far as possible. So, over the course of the evening, um, we'll be hearing from people who have had life-changing experiences through yoga and the benefits it's had on their lives. Uh, we'll also uh, hear more from Sam H about the Charter for Physical Sport and Mental Health uh, and we'll be treated to some demonstrations uh, later on. So um, for now, however, uh, as we have a number of speakers tonight uh, and uh, as always time is marching on, I'm especially pleased to be joined by my friend and colleague Claire Hawkey, MSP, who is the, the Scottish Government Minister for Mental Health. Thank you uh, for inviting me to make an address um, at the event this evening. Tonight's events um, focus on the positive impact that physical activity, physical activity in general, and yoga in particular, can have on mental health. And I'd like to offer my warm thanks to Linda Porter of Yoga Nu for organising this event for us. There's widespread consensus around the evidence base for health, economic and social benefits of physical activity with strong scientific evidence that sufficient regular physical activity is beneficial for the health of the mind and the body and I would say the soul as well. Um, we know that having a mental health problem can put us at even higher risk of developing serious physical health problems than, than other people and those of us with a mental health problem are twice as likely to die from heart disease, four times as likely to die from respiratory disease and on average likely to die between 10 and 17 years earlier than the general population, particularly if they have a diagnosis of schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. And not only that, but some of the medications that we use to treat mental illness can come with side effects including weight gain. In 2017, Mental Health and Learning Disability Inpatient Bed Census uh, found that 1,934 adult patients were either overweight or obese, um, which doesn't really come as a surprise given that as a society really we, we should be moving a bit more and probably eating a bit less, and I count myself in that as well. It's unacceptable though that, that people with severe and enduring mental illnesses have their lives shortened by 15 to 20 years because of physical ill health. But although this may paint a grim picture, there is hope and physical activity improves the heart, the health of the heart, the skeletal muscles, bones, blood, the immune system and the nervous system. And physical activity also improves psychological well-being, self-esteem, it improves mood and it helps with sleep quality. So physical activity also reduces the risk of depression and cognitive decline in adults and older adults. And there's a strong evidence base that adults participating in daily physical activity reduce the risk of depression and dementia by approximately 20 to 30 percent. Now our vision is of a Scotland where more people are more active more often and in part because being active is good for your mental well-being. And recognising the clear links between physical activity and good mental health the Scottish Government awarded £992,000 to Sam H in 2016 for a three-year programme 
to provide physical activity interventions for individuals with mental health problems. Those who could benefit from the programme are referred through existing pathways and work with local leisure trusts who provide physical activity facilities and support. And the programme helps to improve the physical and mental health of people experiencing physical and mental health challenges. And this in turn helps people to live longer and healthier lives through increased levels of physical activity. In addition to this, our natural health service are welcome for the, the differences that they can make to people's well-being. And there are positive steps being made in promoting physical activity throughout Scotland for all of its benefits and not just those of mental health with various initiatives from government and from the third sector. This week not only sees this event introducing us to the benefits of yoga on mental health, but many other events celebrating Scottish Women and Girls Week, um, Women in Sports Week, sorry, uh, 2018, and lots of my MSP colleagues are taking part in various events across the country, various different types of sport and activity. The number of women and girls taking part in a wide variety of physical and sports activities has increased over recent years. And although physical activity levels amongst teenage girls are increasing, there's still more that we can do to increase participation and raise awareness across the sector to remove the barriers that still face some when it comes to getting involved in sport and physical activity. And the Scottish Government established the Women and Girls in Sport Advisory Board to help us to understand what we can do to increase opportunities for every woman and girl in Scotland and to raise awareness across the media and business, which is a key commitment for the Scottish Government. I'd like to thank Angus Macdonald, MSP, for sponsoring this event, Linda Porter for proposing the event, and the other speakers who will be addressing you throughout the evening, Agnes Houston, MBE, John Arthur, Katie Boyle and Robert Nesbitt for the time and energy that they've put into creating this event for us. And now I'd like to hand you over to Linda Porter. Thank you. So I've been harbouring this vision for about 12 to 18 months of this event and you've helped make it reality this evening and uh, that's a really special moment that I just have to, to breathe in. And uh, it's an interesting one because um, it's hard to imagine that five years ago I was uh, on business out in India with the bank I was working for at the time and I would never imagine that five years from then here I would be bringing a little bit of India into Parliament because that's where yoga originated from and uh, just bringing it in, into Scotland and Parliament and, and talking about it. Um, but here's the thing, just like our mental health, everything can change in an instant. And that for me is the importance of this evening, that it's about us all sharing, experiencing and celebrating yoga because yoga can be one of the things that we all have and you have in your toolkit that can support you in your mental health. And this evening is about sharing all the different forms that yoga can take because you may be surprised. And uh, through the things we're sharing this evening, the chair yoga, the sound of healing, many things, as well as hearing people's own inspiring stories about how yoga's helped them in their, their different ways. So I'm firstly going to invite Katie to come up. Now, Katie is going to come and start by sharing with us a meditation. So you can do this comfortably standing, or if you would like to sit, you are more than welcome. And my invitation to you is to, through the meditation, just allow these moments to, whatever day you've had, whatever discussions you've had today, give yourself this opportunity to let all of that slip away from you so that you can really come and feel grounded and more than anything else, just be in this present moment. So we'll just dive right into the meditation. And I invite you, as a way of coming into the session, just to make yourself comfortable. So you can remain standing or seated. And just finding that position where you feel that you can remain alert but relaxed. So not rigid or slouching. Somewhere in between. You can keep your eyes open or have your eyes closed. And if your eyes are open, just rest your gaze at a point in front of you. Your eyes are soft, slightly unfocused, and letting the images in your peripheral vision, vision come in. Relax the muscles around your eyes. And now feel your spine lengthening, and that connection upwards 
to the ceiling and up to the sky. The back of the skull in line with the low back and then feel your legs, your feet, whatever parts of the body connecting down, rooting you down into the floor, into the earth. Um, yeah, so I've got five minutes to tell you, and uh, it's, you know, I've had quite a long time on this planet already, so uh, to, to encompass that in five minutes would be hard. But the Minister touched on it. I come from an area in Edinburgh, about a mile and a half, maybe two miles from here, where the average life expectancy for a man is 62, okay? That's the reality. I came, most of us are aware of adverse childhood experiences now, how that can lead to a shortening of life, how you're much more likely to end up uh, in addiction or other mental health problems. I came into a family uh, of, there was three before me. The oldest one was four and a half when I was born. So I came into a family that was four years, under five years old. My dad was a heavy drinker and a gambler and um, it was, it, was, it was crazy. There was so much violence in the home. There was violence in the streets. There was violence in the school. And I kind of grew up with that. I think I came down the birth canal anxious. I, I get a picture of myself almost like something for family guy, you know. This wee kid coming down the, the, the kind of birth canal screaming, I'm not coming out, I'm not coming out. Because the world I was coming into was absolute madness. It was crazy. And I think I had to develop in ways that helped me cope with that. And, and I did, and it was crazy, and I, I became violent, I became, in a way, protecting myself. And I didn't know it, because I didn't know anything else. That was my life. I, I, that was normal to me. And, and I grew up, and I found alcohol at the age of 11, and other drugs uh, by the age of 15. And these, they, they worked. They worked for me. Uh, the two, I thought it was the feelings that alcohol and other drugs gave me that I loved so much. For the first time in my life, I didn't give a, a, a damn about what anybody thought about me. You know, I was constantly worried about what people thought about me, what, and I was nervous all the time. But I didn't know that, and alcohol seemed to take that away from me. Yeah? So I thought it was actually the feelings that alcohol gave me, that feeling of empowerment and stuff. And I, on I went, I got involved in gang fighting, I got involved in a whole lot of stuff, and I was alcoholic by the age of 18. I did, two hospitalizations for alcohol poisoning by that age. So I did what most of the guys in my area had done when they tried to get away from it, we joined the army. And it was the height of the troubles in Northern Ireland, so I was almost immediately kind of sent over to Northern Ireland, and it was the worst year for violence in, in Northern Ireland. And the army itself at that time was quite violent. So all that kind of stuff, and I used, I was self-medicating with alcohol and other substances. Um, I kind of finally got round to um, getting into recovery about 38. I was 38 years old. By that time, I had a, a couple of kids myself, and um, and I was in the right state. I found Alcoholics Anonymous, or they found me, and then Narcotics Anonymous, and, and that was a great help. I, re I relapsed a few times, but I, I finally got into recovery, and my life changed. I knew I was not stupid, but I left school at 15 with no qualifications. I read avidly, I, I was a, a debater, I was part of the um, anti-vivisection society when I was 15 years old. You know, I, so I had this mind, but I had nothing to back it up. I got into recovery, went to university and trained as a community educator, loved it. Became a campaigner for a lot of different things. And on it went, and I got well for a while, and, and, and I got jobs, and I, I, I ran a voluntary organisation here in Edinburgh for many years. And then about five years ago, a number of things. My, my mental health hadn't been brilliant, but it was, it was stable. Let's call it stable. Um, I'd had uh, help through various quarters. Um, and then about five years ago, a, a number of things happened, as they do. Um, <coughs> My sister uh, died with an overdose, and her and I were like twins. <coughs> so, so, <coughs> sorry. Um, my brother-in-law was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. My best friend had um, cancer. He had a cancer diagnosis, and an ex, my, one of my ex-partners killed herself, all within <coughs> a relatively short space of time. So. <coughs> Uh, I kind of, I was back into meltdown, I didn't pick up drugs again, I didn't pick up alcohol, I, but I was in a bad state. And at that point I met Edinburgh Community Yoga. I, I'd been a founder member of the um, 
the Serenity Cafe here in Edinburgh. I've been a, a community activist for the recovery community in Edinburgh and um, in Scotland, and, and, and I found yoga. I'd been to a couple of classes before at like health, um, leisure centres, but it didn't really do the, the damage. But when I did it with these guys, they explained it to me, and we did pranayama, and we did yoga nidra, we, all that stuff, and it just hit me like that, that this was the real deal. And at the same time, I met my teacher, who's my teacher now, uh, Krishna uh, Srikumar uh, from India, and I loved it, and it helped me tremendously. It stabilised me, and just as I did there, when I was nervous, I was able to use the breathing techniques, use the meditation to kind of calm myself down, the physical exercise. 20 odd years I had chronic back pain. I've had asthma since I was, since I was diagnosed in my 20s, something like that. Since practicing yoga and getting into it every day, my back pain has gone. Yeah? Um, I did, I've not used the inhaler for like three years or something like that. But more than that, what has happened is I, I, think I started to feel whole again. I started to feel, you know, uh, that I was connected to something greater than myself again. And so, with encouragement to uh, uh, other people, I wanted to take, I wanted more yoga for men. And my mate up there, Mick um, from Glasgow, who young, ran uh, classes for yoga for men, we wanted more working class men doing yoga. We've seen the benefit, we were from working class areas ourselves, and we knew the appalling health um, uh, statistics. So we wanted to do that. So I went travelling the world anyway. I, I thought, I'm not getting any younger, I'm going to go travelling the world. And everywhere I went, I did community yoga. I sought it out and, and I did it. And I loved it. And it was all over North America and Canada, right up the coast of Australia and Indonesia. And I ended up in India. And I, I went and did my teacher training in India. No way any thought of, of becoming a teacher because I didn't think I was good enough. And I'd only been doing it for a few years. I was doing it every day, mind you. But it was, uh, and anyway, I went and did it. And I loved it. And I got good feedback. And I came home and I was determined to set up Yoga for Men in Craig Miller and within the recovery community and I, I, I did that. And the feedback has been brilliant and Edinburgh Community Yoga took me on as, as one of their uh, practitioners and I've been able to work with the men at Easter Road Stadium through Sam H. I've been involved in so much as a result of being able to do this. And I, it's been brilliant for me. It's been really good. It stabilised me and, and I feel so much better. I'm going to just quickly finish with some of the feedback for the people. So the people that come to my classes are veterans from the military who have post-traumatic stress. They've got a whole range of different issues. People in recovery from addiction. Uh, people in the looked after system. So I'm going into the locked up um, uh, young people's units and, and teaching yoga there. And I think I've got something I can connect with people. I've got lived experience, shared experience with these people. Uh, and, and, and it seems to work. So here's some of the things. So one of the, one of the respondents says, it calms my mind down and helps me put perspective on issues in my life. It helps me sleep better and gives me more confidence. That from a woman who was, who, who was you know, frightened of her own shadow. Better understanding of how to take care of my body and better understanding how my mind and body work together. Got a better sense of who I am and what is important to me. Helps me to have a positive outlook. It challenges negative thinking and behaviour. These are all from people who, a lot of society look at them and they say they're broken. And they are in a lot of ways. But yoga is a great thing for bringing people together and we've got a community. I run a community class on a Friday and we bring some food for afterwards. So we do our yoga, we have good fun, and then we, we have a, a blether afterwards. And people are coming. One woman says, um, it helps me to get out as I tend to stay at home for very long periods, which I'm aware is detrimental to my mental well-being. And, and it's lovely, honestly. I've been privileged to meet the yoga community. And I'm here tonight with some of my heroes in this room, yoga teachers who are far more experienced than me and far better at teaching probably. But I love it. I feel part of a community. I feel part, I really feel connected. So I want to thank you uh, for giving me the opportunity to come along tonight and share that with you. And I hope the rest of it goes really well. Thank you. How can I come after what we've just heard? Absolutely amazing. And thanks to all the speakers who came before me. 
I feel a wee bit out of my depth um, here with all these great yogis round about me. Hello, my name is Agnes. I was diagnosed with dementia of the Alzheimer's type 13 years ago. I was still working. Sadly, I could no longer do my job properly. So I left my working life behind. I was only 57. I started to ask myself, what now? What about Agnes? What's next? What's my future to be? I felt hopeless, helpless, and full of despair. I had no job and no purpose in life. I heard in the media that exercise was recommended for people with dementia. So I joined my local gym. I tried many classes, but loved my intro to yoga with Alison, who's here helping me tonight. It was on a Sunday. And that's how my yoga journey started. And I've never looked back since then. But let me tell you a little about dementia. According to the books in 2006, you only had five to eight years to live after a diagnosis. Everything was doom and gloom. However, that was 13 years ago. And yes, believe it or not, it's Agnes standing here, not a ghost. <laughs> Since then, I have met many people living nearly 20 years at home with this condition. Were the books wrong? I don't know. I just can tell you the truth of what I've seen. In Scotland, dementia is dealt with in the mental health care environment. And that's why I'm here, because I'm entitled to be here. Because <laughs> according to my diagnosis, I've got a mental health condition. But dementia is more than your mental health. It's more than memory. Dementia is actually an organic disease of the brain. It affects you physically, mentally, and has social implications. And yoga was the only thing that helped me in all of these areas. Yoga gave me the tools to deal with the challenges that dementia brought to my door. The physical side of yoga practice improves my coordination and balance and specifically reduced the number and severity of my falls which required hospitalisation. Now if asked, most people would say that dementia is all about loss of memory. But for me and others with dementia, dementia had sensory challenges which is covered in a free booklet on the table outside. I have some, as I say, and you can take it away. It's free of charge. You don't get much free of charge. <laughs> Another challenge for me was hallucinations. I wonder how many people knew that you could get hallucinations with dementia. All types of dementia, not just rare dementias. My hallucinations is Charles Bonney syndrome and it's due to my neurological vision impairment caused by dementia. For this, when the hallucinations start, I use breath work, which my lovely person before me talked about. This helps to still my racing heart and to be calm. Having hallucinations is no joy. I won't recommend it to you. <laughs> Has my mental health and has my mental wellness improved since I started yoga? You've got to believe it. Yoga has taught me to accept Agnes with dementia, to be gentle with myself. When I cannot do things the way I used to, I'm no longer harsh. I do not listen to that negative voice as we heard spoken about. My yoga buddies in all of my classes has encouraged me and supported me through the highs and lows of my dementia. And this has helped with the social isolation that we heard about all mental health conditions. 
The discipline of attending classes gave me purpose and hope, and it helped prevent apathy. It was so easy to sit in the house thinking, poor me, poor Agnes. And apathy can be a big issue with dementia. Dementia can cause anxiety and emotional issues as well. Yoga breathing that I learned helped me with this. Breath work. We all breathe, but it's how you breathe that makes the difference. It also improved my respiratory issues, which I happened to come along with my dementia as well. <coughs> and I was recently in hospital um, with pneumonia, and a hospital physio said I was the first person she had met during all her physio training who had done breathing properly. <laughs> she then went on to ask me to come and talk to the physios in my local hospital about <laughs> yoga, dementia and breath work. So this reduced my stay in hospital. So it does save money. And not many people. Is the health minister still in? <laughs> um, having dementia badly affected my sleep pattern. And please believe me, I'm no special person within, with dementia. I'm speaking for a lot of people that would stand up here and tell the same story. Sleep pattern with frequent insomnia, hallucinations, is quite common with dementia and a nightly affair for me. Guided yoga, meditation, mindfulness supported me to sleep better and deal with these long dark hours before the dawn would hit. Quite simply put, yoga is the best thing I have ever done for my mental and physical health. As dementia is more than memory, Yoga is more than exercise. Namaste. I think if Agnes was um, saying about John, hard to follow John, I think I'm really struggling to follow John and Agnes. <laughs> so, and I, and I kind of, when, I, when we were developing this and looking at this, I always knew that that was going to be the case. And for the first time in a long time, I'm glad that that's the case because it's important that we share experiences and it's important that we hear those experiences and the impact that sport and physical activity can make on people's lives. And I also have to say, it is a joy to have worked with Lindsay. Uh, <laughs> you yogis are, are the most amazing bunch. <laughs> you really are. And the commitment that you have shown to the charter is something to be very proud of and to actually celebrate and that's hopefully what we're doing here tonight is reflecting on the impact that sport, physical activity can have and I wanted to share um, a few things with you. It won't come as a surprise to any of you that research suggests to us that the less physical activity that a person does, the more likely they are to experience lost mood, depression and tension and worry. It won't come as a surprise for many of you because we hear about this, that 36% of individuals in Scotland don't meet physical activity recommendations. And we have to ask ourselves why that is. What's stopping us from actually engaging in something that can make a huge difference in our life that we are seeing here today? But it may surprise you that judgment and stigma still remains a key barrier to engage in physical activity. And whilst we're doing lots around that and doing lots of work, we still have a long way to go. And I'm very welcome to see so many people here in the room that are actually championing forward things around the Charter. Not only in terms of saying that they support it, but actually putting those words of support into action. We also know, because we did some research into this, over the last couple of years, we've done some research into asking people with lived experience what is preventing them from engaging in sport and physical activity. And actually over 500 people engaged, they gave us their voice, they told us what they were 
there was about, and they said the barriers were confidence, esteem, they said anxiety and fear, they spoke about motivation being an issue for them, they spoke about others, new groups joining new things can actually prevent them from coming along. And again, they spoke about judgment and stigma. These five things have remained the top five things over the last couple of years, which stop people with mental health problems with lived experience from engaging in sport and physical activity. But they also gave us some really, really insightful information. They told us what could remove barriers. They told us that more opportunities. Awareness of mental health and wellbeing so they said quite clearly out to the sport and physical activity community, actually, make awareness of mental health part of what you do. Because if you do that, that will help for us to engage with you. They told us that they wanted promotional messages and they wanted role models They could say that. Not just the sports models like Sir Chris Hoy, who has been championing mental health for 10 years with us, but also real life role models. More models like John and Agnes, who actually, their stories can make such a difference and share with people and remind them, actually, you're like me and actually I can do things rather than where I think that I might not be able to. So we, a number of years ago, started to come up with a concept around Scotland's mental health charity for physical activity and sport, a, charity, a, a charter that was aimed to break down the barriers to engaging, participating and achieving. And actually we reached out. In February we launched the Mental Health Charter. We launched it here in Edinburgh at the Orium and we had a number of individuals that engaged with us around that. And some, I'm really pleased to say, are in the room here today. People like Sports Scotland, uh, sorry, Glasgow Sport, NHS Health Scotland, we had Sporta, we had NL Leisure and we had KL Leisure who were all coming to be part of this and be part of a steering group and give their time, uh, those resources in order to engage it, including Sports Scotland as well. And we all started to work and take the information that we had to create something that was going to be meaningful. And that charter is meaningful because what it did for the first time in a long while was raise awareness of the importance of physical activity and sport around our mental health and wellbeing. But we made it pretty challenging as well. We asked people, don't just pledge, don't do what we've seen others do before, don't just sign up to say something and say, I support this. Actually, put your support and put it into action. So the only way that you can become a signatory of the Charter is if you put an action plan together. If you put an action plan that says, this is how we and our area are going to break down the barriers. And actually around this room again, we see a number. Uh, we are joined by Basketball Scotland, who were one of the early charter signatories, who actually came to us and said, we want to do this. We're not quite sure how we're going to do it, but help us to do it. And that passion, Scottish Sport Future, was, was another example of where they stood up and asked to give support for this and actually say, we want to do something around it. Walking Football Scotland is to name. And there's a whole list that I could go through to say. Within the Charter, we said we want you to actively promote inclusive practices. We want you to develop inclusive policies and practices. So not just at an operational level, we want you to think strategically. We want you to embed it in your strategic development and your strategic thinking around doing this. We want to see you take that kind of action. We also want to encourage participation, so we want to see you actively promote things. We want to see you participate in a network where we can learn from each other. And tonight's a great example when you have this many yoga organisations and people like Lindsay. Because when Lindsay signed up to the charter, she didn't just sign up herself. She got 14 other organisations to sign up. <laughs> and I think that's really important. And that shows you that that voice can actually make a difference. And we are hoping to see other governing bodies like Basketball Scotland, like Scottish Athletics, or organisations that we've partnered with like Jobs Scotland, who are actually championing through things. 
And if you're any doubt about the difference the charter can make, I want you to actually listen to what a couple of people have told us. Removing potential barriers and increasing opportunities for people with mental health problems uh, could have a positive effect on participation. It will help raise awareness and I think it will make people more comfortable to come forward and try new things if it's spoken about. And if there was one message that they could give out, people would tell us things like, be reassuring, supportive, and work at everybody's individual pace. Train your staff members. And advertise the fact that you trained people to help with mental health issues become more active. Let it be known, let it celebrate the work that you're doing. But we also put some other things. We put some tools behind this to support people. So we put a, we put a mental health toolkit, we gave uh, media images, everything like that, so that those messages could get out there. And many of you that have been looking at Lindsay's, for example, website will see some of those things already there. That actually sends such a strong message out to people that can be the difference. Jog Scotland has a fantastic example of someone who was part of one of their jogging groups. And because a particular jogging group promoted mental health and wellbeing, that person was trying to find a way back in because in their life they had a really serious episode around their mental health that meant they got hospitalised, they really need support, they wanted desperately to get back in. But because they saw that that group was promoting mental health, it made it much easier for them to come in and take part in stuff. That's the difference that we can make. And if you want to understand the commitment across Scotland to the Charter, we set out two targets for ourselves. So we launched in February, our first target, because we often know that in the early part you get quite a lot of sign-ups. So we set a target of 50 signatures by the end of July. And then the following year, leading up to the end of July 2019, we wanted a further 50. We wanted 100 signatures across the sports body from governing bodies to grassroots. We wanted those to sign up. That was our number. We thought that was an ambitious target. Today, we have 114 people signed up to the Charter. That shows you there is a commitment across Scotland within the physical activity and sports world who are really want to lead the way here, who recognise the difference that it can make. We heard the Minister speak also about some of the work that Sam H has done in a project called ALBA. Active lives become achievable. And on our steering group is an, is an individual who came through that programme, who volunteers as part of that programme, who is engaged in that programme and who has been hugely supportive to the work that we've done. There's a chap called Craig, uh, if you want to meet him, he's over here. He'll be very embarrassed that I've done this to him, but he's, he'll, he'll love that. But Craig's a great example and a great ambassador for it. Uh, the impact that sport can have, the impact that you can have on people's lives when you create the right environment, you create it in the right way, can actually mean that people engage, that they engage, they participate and they achieve. And I asked Craig a number of weeks ago to give me a statement about what was the difference that being part of something that creates that environment that does it, that does it. and I want to leave you with this. Craig said, it's the first time that I experienced an approach where they worked and saw the person. That I am rather than my disability or my mental health problem. This approach gave me some of the self-esteem, inner belief again, rather than the anger, resentment that I felt with other programmes I was previously on. Create the right environment, promote it the right way, put the right messages out there, make ourselves accessible because of the difference that you can make in people's lives is shown here tonight. Thank you very much. So we've talked about physical activity, so now we're going to allow you to get into a little bit of activity, just in the means of stretching, so there are more refreshments outside. But in addition, we're going to hold and we invite you to experience some chair yoga. So we have some chairs over here. And I'd just like to say that chair yoga is designed for all minds and bodies, and you've probably got that message by now. But if you happen to have a suit on, whatever you've got on, chair yoga is going to be perfect for you. 
Um, I don't think there's much else for me to say. I think we've heard it all from John, from Agnes and, and from Robert and Lindsay. Um, we're really delighted to be here. What was just said about inclusivity, I think, is one of the most important things. We know now and we really understand the benefits of yoga. We know the benefits on mental health. We know the benefits on physical health. And increasingly, we've got the, the neuroscientific evidence um, that really helps us to explain to people in healthcare, people in science, why this is an important practice and why we need to really make yoga a, an inclusive and accessible practice. But what Robert said there really highlights, and what we know is it isn't enough to just say to somebody, hey, you should go and do yoga, because we know that many, many people are excluded from participating in yoga, often because of the, I'm going to go as far as to say untrue, but a lot of the perceptions around what yoga is I mean that the vast majority of people that we're talking about here, lots and lots of people with mental health issues, and in particular people with addiction issues and affected by trauma and complex trauma, will not walk into a yoga studio. Um, and as an organisation, the Edinburgh Community Yoga, we really exist with the sole purpose of trying to make yoga accessible. Um, the way that we do that is by fundraising, doing grant applications, and working, partnering with organisations in the community to take yoga to where people are. So we, we go into organisations, we use the spaces that we have, we work in prisons, we work in psychiatric hospitals, we work with community groups like Comas, SAMH, um, and we take yoga there. And again, that isn't enough, so we offer people the opportunity to experience yoga in those places. And then one of our really clear aims is to try and allow people to grow their practice, so we give people the confidence um, to be able to, to reach out and explore yoga in a different context. And what we're beginning to see is people moving from an outreach class, over time beginning to start to explore different yoga studio options. And one of the main, one of the main barriers to that is about cost. So we are working with yoga studios in the city to try to offer scholarship programs um, and also to introduce people into a yoga community in a way that feels safe and that feels like it's available to them. And that, I think, is one of the biggest challenges that we as yoga teachers have, is how do we make our spaces inclusive? And it's not enough to say that they're inclusive. How do we actually reach out and welcome people into the space? Um, we recently funded our, our first student with somebody who came to one of my very first eight-week programs for people in addiction recovery five years ago. And she has, she has volunteered with us. She supported us in our programs. And we recently funded her through a yoga teacher training, and she's now offering 100 hours of her own yoga teaching back to our organisation. And um, people like John are, are creating the platform for really getting the word out there that yoga is for everybody, and you do not have to have fancy clothes, and you don't have to be able to stand on your head. It's about moving and breathing. Um, and I think what we really need to do is start to move the conversation back to that being what yoga is, to make everybody realise that, that it is a practice that is accessible for them. Um, and I think doing this is a really brilliant way to demonstrate that. So we're going to do a short chair yoga programme. This is something that was developed um, in our work with NHS staff. I don't know if anybody here works in the NHS. I have done, um, and I work at the medical school. But one of the things that we do is run a fairly big programme for NHS staff health and wellbeing. And the first thing that people say is, I can't do yoga, I don't have the right clothes. And what we do is we go into wards, really, really busy clinical environments. We offer back-to-back 20-minute -back sessions. Um, where anybody, doctors, nurses, admin staff, can get off the board, come and sit down to 20 minutes of yoga and go back to work. So Laura's going to take us through one of those sessions just now and please just feel free to get involved. And I just want to say thanks to Lindsay, to Robert, to Sam H, to everybody for being here because it's, it's so exciting for me to see everybody here. So thank you.
So permission to you all to float home this evening and sleep really well <laughs> in the knowledge it's really good for your mental health. Um, sometimes some water after this kind of experience can help you ground, especially if you are getting back into transport and driving. So we are coming to the end of our evening of yoga, mental health and well-being and I'd uh, just like to take the opportunity to say a really big thank you for all of you coming, to all of the speakers all of the people that have helped this evening, just help it run so smoothly. And uh, yeah, just all the connections. And the connections is really one of the most important parts. And we've connected here with our yoga and our mental health. But those connections go on. So really it's just the beginning, just the start. And obviously Sam H of helping keep spreading those connections.